U.S. versus China, trade, technology, and financial markets, assessments, implications, drivers, scenarios, and predictions for the future. Everyone loves predictions, so please find your seat to the main hall. And in this conversation, we were joined by Akiko Fujita from Yahoo Finance, and Vida Renanich from the Barrow Consulting Group, and Anthony Scaramucci from Skybridge. Please welcome our speakers. All right. Is, our last is this our last session of the day? Last no, session. we have two more. Two oh, more you've got sessions. two more. Okay, two great. Two more, and then we have evening entertainment. Gonna, and Anthony gonna, will be uh, playing uh, piano. They look nicer than the White House press corps, so they could probably <laughs> take some questions. Yeah. All right, they, we're they in. Look they look less drunk than the White House press corps, too, just by looking at them. Yeah, we're in the home stretch here, right? Uh, great. So um, I want to keep this kind of loose. You know, we'll just uh, maybe start broader here because uh, the theme of this conference has been the intersection of alternative investment classes. Um, Vidaka, I wonder if we can we throw the question to you first um, in terms of what you've heard so far today that has kind of stood out to you in terms of uh, the conversations. Okay, well, the, the, the conference is about integrating um, alternative investment classes, which pretty much is hedge funds, uh, private equity, and venture capital, and real estate. And uh, we've been introducing emerging technology, fintech, and big data, which in essence is alternative data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, really one ecosystem. So the world has changed, and the world of investment management is changing. And so somebody who is in in the shoes of investment managers should definitely be aware of alternative data and what they can do in terms of extracting alpha. Anthony, we've been talking a lot, I think, on, on a macro level about sort of these structural changes that are happening globally, but also um, sort of this, the, the changes that we've seen in some of these governments, the rise of protectionism, what the backlash has been on that front. Um, when you sort of scan the world right now, what stands out to you as the biggest risk? I mean, among many risks, but from a financial perspective, the biggest risk is the, you know, the complete breakdown of the currency system, which now most of the countries are manipulating their currency to a degree. Uh, the coordination of central banking monetary policy is another very big risk, and, and obviously 40 percent or so of the sovereign debt in the world is below, you know, has a negative yield, so that's got to be very concerning. Uh, and then just speaking about the hedge funds, you think about the alternative investment world, I had lunch today, I won't name the person, it's not important, but he had $19 billion of capital three years ago. He has $11 billion of capital today. His performance has been quite good, but it's not pacing with an ETF. So here's a guy paying, you know, you're paying him one and a half and 20. He's got very good risk adjusted returns. But if you could put your money in an ETF and get a 25% return, or let's say the stock market uh, since 2016 up, I don't know what the exact number is, but 50-ish, 45-ish percent, uh, it sort of really put a, a dampener on the hedge fund industry and the demand in the industry. So those your, are the things. Uh, I want to go back to your, your first point when you say, you know, when you look globally, everybody's manipulating their currency. You're talking about in the context of central banks and, and the easy, easy money that exists and, and their ability yeah. to control the currency. Yeah, but, but re remember, though, the, uh, you, know, you had the breakdown of Bretton Woods in 1971 when the U.S. Uh, took itself off the gold standard. Uh, people forget this, but the U.S. allowed China to clip itself to the U.S. dollar. We did that because we were really trying to crush the Soviet Union and we wanted the Chinese help with the Soviet Union, and that worked. You know, they, they each had 650,000 standing troops on their respective border as a result of Nixon and Kissinger's negotiation with China. But remember, that allowed the Chinese to link their currency to our currency. We were devaluing our currency to pay back our debt, and the Chinese were beginning a buildup of manufacturing and creating a mercantilist society. Uh, people will remember this from 11th grade, maybe they won't. You take unfinished goods, you create finished goods, and you sell them at a depressed currency, uh, you're going to have an economic boom. That's what the Chinese did. And then, obviously, the, the Germans figured out what the Chinese were doing, so they created this fictitious currency called the euro, which is really not a currency. It's a fixed exchange rate me mechanism. Uh, and they knew that they could, I mean, here was the theory. Let's tie ourselves to the southern European nations. 
These guys are, uh, you know, they're swimming naked in the Mediterranean, drinking ouzo, retiring at the age of 55, and they're going to devalue their currency every five years. And we're up here in northern Germany. We can clip ourselves to them. And lo and behold, the Germans for 30 years uh, were selling their finished goods at a 30% discount, now about a 22% discount to where the Deutsche Mark was. And so, and the United States allowed this to happen. Uh, some of it was intentional, some of it was unintentional. Uh, but we're here now, and the side effects of all this stuff is that it hollowed out manufacturing, it depressed some of the rural areas and some of the Rust Belt areas, and it created a lot of anger, which led to the specter and rise of nationalism. Did I, do you agree? I have to agree. You agree? Absolutely. I mean, so uh, you know, e e EU is, uh, is, a, uh, is an artificial, well, uh, he's a guest, so I have to agree, right? <laughs> Don't agree because don't agree, I'm a guest. You can, e you know, EU is, listen, a, I, is a, I've been is fired a, in shorter times in this session, okay? You can pull okay. me right out of the seat. So, so, so we gonna, you don't have to agree. Go there. So, so this panel okay. is actually two against one. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm a moderator as well. Did you know that? I it's didn't a surprise, know that. So you're right? fire, fire uh, some can we? Can you elaborate a little bit on 11 and a half days, please? The 11, it was actually... Well, it was absolutely brutal, actually, but let's, let's go back. Um, so... Uh, you know, this is a cautionary tale. There's a lot of investors in the room. So let me start out by saying, do not, and I repeat, do not put your pride and ego into your decision making. So the, every time in my life uh, that I've done that, it's led to some level of a disaster for me, whether it was investing, personal relationship, or the situation in the White House. So what happened to me was I had no expectations to work in government. And if you look at my life's history, I had 30 years on Wall Street, had two reasonably successful businesses. I was hosting Wall Street Week for the Fox Business Network on the weekends. And I had the SALT conference, which you've attended and some of the people here have attended. And so I was having a very nice life. And then I was backing Jeb Bush, if people remember that. And then so now uh, candidate Trump was slaying everybody and he asked me to go work for him. I accepted that. And then the mistake was, uh, when he got elected, I got uh, what some people call Potomac fever. What is Potomac fever? The president-elect of the United States says, hey, I'd like you to come into my government and serve me. And, you know, I've lived a good part of the American dream. I grew up in a blue-collar family, uh, went to Tufts and Harvard, built two successful businesses. So I'm like, okay, wow, I can go serve the American government and perhaps help solve the problem that we're describing, this evacuation of the middle class, and the, the challenge of people that I grew up with that were economically aspirational, transitioning into economically desperational. So I said, okay, I'm interested in doing that. What job do you have for me? He said, well, I'd like you to make, make you my chief networking officer, and so I was gonna be the president's OPL director. So if you go back to January of 2017, I was named to be the president's OPL director, but I didn't really understand Washington. And so Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon did not want me to have that job. And so smarter people than me, Chris Christie, uh, Vinnie Viola, that was named Secretary of the Army, when they did the Washington two-step on them, they had political experience, and so they were like, okay, we got the message, we're gonna stay where we are. I didn't, I overreacted. When they went to block me, I put my pride and my ego into it. And so now I called the president, and I said, okay, these are two bad guys. When you want to get rid of them, call me, I'll take care of it for you. That was a really bad decision. That was a really bad mistake, okay? So six months in the administration, not going well, leaks everywhere. He calls me and says, you were right. I said, okay, no problem, I'll come in and get rid of these guys. And I probably shouldn't have started on day one with a, hockey mask and a machete in my hand. I probably shouldn't have done that. But that's where I was, and I was ready to take those guys out. And uh, the fight started. I made a mistake on the phone with the reporter. It's well documented. This was a guy that lived on Long Island with me. His father was uh, very close friends with my dad. They worked on the same construction site. A fellow Italian-American from the next town over. I said something that I would say to you, frankly, very flippantly, very colloquially, and he was taping me and he ran to write a story about it, exaggerated the extent of the story, 
I, I own that. I've never once said that it was anybody's fault other than mine. Um, but those 11 days, I got an 11-day PhD in Washington scumbaggery, okay? I can tell you more about your nation's capital today than I could prior to that. Um, you know, and I got ejected quickly. Uh, no blood. I owned it, took responsibility for it, and by and large, stayed very loyal to the president's agenda because I thought that was the right thing to do. I'm not bitter or anything like that. I said, okay, made a mistake, got fired. Uh, let me stay loyal to the president's agenda. But then the goalposts continued to move. Child separation policy. Sorry, I'm not in love with, as an American, whatever you think of the immigration policy, I don't like the women separated from the children and in cages. We can do the what aboutism that you see on Fox News and say, well, what about Obama? He created it. What about this? What about that? We're doing what aboutism. Rand Paul is going to do what aboutism for the next three weeks on, you know, TV. No problem. So he did you a favor. So did he do me a favor? In a way, right? Uh, no, I mean, very listen. Very hard to, you know, to, to be somebody else um, and to try did he to do kind me of a favor? mitigate I would the, say, uh, I would say, no, he didn't really do me any favors, actually, but... But I learned a lot. I think if you ask me the question, am I glad that I went through it? That am I glad that I experienced it as painful as so much of it was? Um, yes, I'm glad I experienced it. Um, but no, I don't think he did me a favor. I mean, doesn't the guy doesn't do people favors? He's a very, he's a very, he's a very. You could be a supporter of his. That's fine. And I respect your right to be his supporter. But he's a very one-way guy, and so he doesn't. I'm do talking favors. about the journalist. Oh, did the journalist do me a favor? No, very dishonest guy. I don't think the journalist did me a favor. In fact, I would say to you that uh, Howie Kurtz, who runs Media Buzz, said to me, 40 years in Washington, he never saw a journalist do that to a White House official. Uh, anybody ever meet Rahm Emanuel? If you guys think I curse a lot, you have no idea. Okay, this guy says the F-bomb every 13 seconds, but nobody did that to him. And Akiko wouldn't do that. She's too professional to do that. I can get away with it on TV. <laughs> but no, no, you wouldn't have done that to me. If I said a curse word in front of you, you wouldn't have run out there and done that. So what I said to the guy, I'm not going to mention his name, I said, okay, you're doing that to me. It's very transactional. You and I are going to lose our relationship. Our families are friends for 50 years. Uh, are you sure you want to do that? Don't you want to create a longer-term relationship with me? And don't we have history going back into the 1960s between our parents? Uh, I don't care. This is an important story for me to tell, and I'm telling it. Okay, well, I'm going to lose my job. You're going to get your story. He's had four jobs since he did that to me, um, and I lost my job. But you know what? It is what it is. I don't blame him. I blame myself. I made a mistake. But let me just say this to you because I think it's very important. If you put your pride and ego into things, your emotions are going up, and your intelligence is going down. Does everybody understand that? And so if you're an investor here, amen, right? And so that's what happened to me. I had my guard down, my emotions were charged, and I should have been way more dispassionate about it, and I should have been way more on watch. You know, when Harry Truman said, if you want a uh, friend in Washington, buy a dog, I mean, even the goddamn dogs are biting in Washington now, but I'm just saying, <laughs> that's what he said, right? And that's probably really true. And I made a mistake, and so I own the mistake, but I think it's a, you know, I'm now back in the investment world. We're, you know, growing again, thank God. But I would say to you, when you make a mistake like that in investing, it can be really costly as well. So take your emotions out of things. Look at things clinically. And, uh, yes, it was a tumultuous period. Uh, some of you probably don't know this, but it was on the front page of the New York Post. I was going through a divorce at the time. Uh, my wife filed for it. My wife hated Trump. And... There's a lot of reasons why, but stuff that, you know, you know, she knows for different reasons. And so she was like, please don't go work for him. I went to go work for him. She filed for divorce. She's like, okay, I got to get, get out of this marriage. This guy is more focused on Potomac fever than he is his family. And so we reconciled, thank God. That was a very difficult process. And uh, when you're getting a public divorce like that and you're getting, you're walking the wa wa walk of shame in the New York Post, you're like, okay, how the hell are you going to survive this? But we have managed to put our marriage back together. Um, we do a podcast called Mooch and the Miss. It's a lot cheaper than therapy. I just recommend it to people. And so, you know, and she probably takes a cheese grater to my forehead for 45 minutes. But, but the point, point being is that, like, we love each other. We care about each other. We went through that process together. I think we're stronger today. 
But man, let me tell you something. I got fired from the White House, lit up just about every newspaper, lit up on all the cable news networks. The tabloids had me uh, getting divorced. Uh, it was a rough period of time. And so, you know, what you have to do in a situation like that is own it. Um, and you can't walk away from it. And you can't do this. You know that because you we know each other for over a decade now. You know, you have to own your mistakes and you have to go forward and, and like look at them and hopefully learn from them and evolve as you're doing this stuff. But let's talk about where you. you've gone yeah. since mm -hmm. because I, you've since you've left the White House, you've become quite critical of President Trump. You highlighted some policies like the separation um, at the border as one concern. How much of your criticism today with this administration is the result of what you saw in the inner workings of the White House? How much of it is about the policies that we've so, seen the administration push since? So I, I, would, I would say, frankly, to everybody here, I was, you know, I was there for 11 days. And you know, I didn't say... You, you said more. a half a day more, but yeah. you know, listen, some people say 10, it hurts my feelings. I was there for 11. <laughs> and you know, I was, it was too short of a period of time for me to really evaluate it from that perspective. So when I left, I said, listen, I'm a supporter of the president. I'm a supporter of his agenda. I'm going to speak well of the president, his agenda, and his team. But where I see stuff that I disagree with, I'm my own person. Everybody in this room, a lot of these people are Wall Street people, and so you know if, if you call me and I'm gonna buy 10,000 shares of Citibank from you, and it's at 30, you sell it to me, five seconds later, it goes to 20, well then you have to have faith in me and my integrity based on that verbal conversation. I own those shares, and even though they, they drop five seconds later, and so I'm not a politician. And so, you know, the integrity of that process on Wall Street is usually valuable to me. So I am not going to say, when the president's in Helsinki at a podium like that, and he's disavowing the intelligence agencies, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. He called me that day and said, why are you going against me? I said, I'm really not going against you, I'm for America. You can't say that. And by the way, Mr. President, I was with you the day, and a lot of New Yorkers are here. Remember when the cops were shot in Brooklyn? It was a real tragedy. They were, they were shot through the uh, driver's side passenger window. The two police officers were very young. They were both killed. Uh, do you, does anybody remember here the police officers turning their backs on Bill de Blasio? Does anybody remember that happening? Okay, and, and to Bill de Blasio's credit, he's not my favorite mayor, but once they turned their backs on him, he did support the police department from there on, and we've had a very low crime rate in the city. So he's done a lot of other things I think are horrific, but point being, I said to the president, I was with you that day when you were flipped out about that. Okay, these intelligence agencies, I know you're sore at Comey and Clapper and Brennan, and you're sore at a collection of these guys, but these intelligence agencies and these rank and file people have by and large kept the country safe for the last 18 to 20 years. You can't disavow them in front of the Russian president on the international state. So I'm not gonna agree with that. You're a member of the press, you don't look like the enemy to me. Okay, there are members of the press here. The press, they're not the enemy of the people. When the Constitution got set up, the founders were afraid of things. What were they afraid of? Tyranny. They were afraid of autocracy. And they also, they wrote that they needed to protect the most sacred minority in a civilization. Who's that? It's the individual. And so they wanted to make sure that the individual was protected from mob rule. That's why you have an electoral college. That's why you have two senators for every state, even though Rhode Island is slightly smaller than California. That's why they set it up the way they set it up. And the First Amendment was to protect people so that people like you could hold people in power accountable. And the other reason, because we're a nation of capitalism, the First Amendment teaches our children to speak and think freely, a result of which they go on and create Facebook and Apple Computer and Google. And in China, you lived in China, mm -hmm. a good part of the internet is censored. And by the way, your children can't talk negatively about the political regime in China. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, China, you come in, you have to have a VPN. And uh, even if you have a VPN, sometimes you're not allowed to do anything. They're, they're just monitoring you. Yeah. Okay, okay so, so that causes a curbing of intellectual growth, intellectual capital, and intellectual innovation, which is why they have to steal a lot of the stuff from the West. But my point is the First Amendment protects you and helps your economy grow. You can't be the leader of the free world and win the election 
and be the leader of the United States and call the press the enemy of the people. So I wrote and spoke out against that, still supporting the president. I'm on the Bill Maher show, and I was with Bill this weekend because he was at MSG. I went to see his show on Saturday night. I'm on the Bill Maher show in August. I supported seven of the eight things. It got to the congresswomen. Okay, I don't know. I think that's full-blown racist to be talking like that. That's me. Uh, remember, I'm a product of an Italian-American upbringing. They told my Italian-American grandmother, she got to the country in 1923. She was in Brooklyn trying to find a job, couldn't. There were signs in the shops that said, Nina, no Italians need apply. Also stood for the Irish. So she worked as a maid. And she worked herself up and she created her job, but she's always be upset about that. Go back to the country that you came from. Today's Veterans Day. My uncle Anthony, who I'm named after, was on Normandy Beach. He stormed the beach, was wounded, got the Purple Heart. My, my brother's other, uh, my mom's other brother uh, was at the Battle of the Bulge. So my grandmother produced three children. One was my mom, two are World War II veterans, one is still alive, 94. Should she go back to the country that she came from? I mean, come on, it's a ridiculous nativist trope. And uh, you shouldn't be saying that from the presidency. So now I'm on the show. I'm defending this, I'm defending that, defending this. Bill Maher says to me, well, what about that? I said, you know what, I can't defend that. Uh, I really wish the president would stop saying that, but listen, I'm defending these other things. The very next day, he attacked Bill Maher. I did laugh about that. I said, oh shit, he watched the show. And then two hours later, he attacked me. Okay, I actually thought that was funny. I didn't really care. I'm a public figure. I can handle myself. But then he went after my wife. Okay, so now go back and look at what he said. He knows my wife and I were in a divorce. He said some mean things about my wife in the tweet. He's the president of the United States. She is a suburban housewife on Long Island trying to raise two young children. You can be a supporter and you can gaslight that behavior and you can pretend it's normal or maybe you're Sean Hannity and you have like a decoder ring in your head or something like that, I don't know. You can do whatever you want, but that's not normal. You wanna go after me, I'm a public figure, no problem. Do not go after my wife. I'm an Italian kid from Long Island. I grew up in a neighborhood. Don't go after the women in my family. Okay, so that's it for me. That's it for me. And so, you know, that's a red line and that's it. I'm, do I look like Ted Cruz to you? You do okay, not look I'm like I'm not Ted, Ted Cruz. Cruz to me. Okay? You don't go after my wife. Okay, and, and that level of boundarylessness is why we're in the trouble that we're in. And that's why you have three or four whistleblowers. And this is why you have this level of lawlessness that's about to unfold on the nation. So you guys ask me, I'm telling you the truth. I tried to stay with him. He kept moving the goalposts. Look at what he did to Michael Cohen, and look at what he's now doing to Mayor Giuliani, okay? What happens is to stay with him, he's moving the goalposts. You know, he's, he's like that man or woman that you dated as a kid that's got a borderline personality. Keep moving the goalposts on you. Keep moving the goalposts. And so now Rudy's over the line now, and now is there any coming back for Rudy Giuliani, honestly? Let's say he's exonerated from this thing. Is there any coming back? Look what he's doing to Pompeo. Now, Nikki Haley wants to be Pompeo, so she's out there hitting Rex Tillerson and John Kelly. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. So to me, you guys may like it because your 401k is up, or you may look at certain things that he's doing, uh, but this is a level of lawlessness that I don't think is going to be good for our system. Well, and you've said, I think, on our shows a few times that, that you think that impeachment will go through next year. I think I heard you last I week say- I said that he's gonna get impeached. Yeah, he's no. gonna get impeached. Is he gonna get removed from office as a result of impeachment? I don't know. Right now, I would have predicted three months ago. Uh, three, when he after went after my wife, I said, okay, this guy's crazy. This is a full-blown Trump noble. Yeah, anybody see the HBO series Chernobyl? Okay, all right, you remember the series? So the thing's melting down. We've got the Trump noble, the orange meltdown is happening. And then you're looking around, and then so the apparatchiks are either gonna cover it up or they're gonna clean it up. And then there's a scene in, the, in Chernobyl, the HBO series, they say, okay, we're gonna irradiate all the drinking water from here to the Black Sea. They're like, okay, we better clean it up. We're gonna try to cover it up, but now we're gonna kill everybody, so we better clean it up. And so they begin the process of cleanup. So I figured the Republicans were gonna work on cleanup for a period of time and then realize the guy is totally crazy and he can't run a process and you have people telling you that, whether it's me or pretty directly John Kelly or sort of directly Jim Mattis, 
can't run a process, can't manage a process. And now you got the anonymous person. You know, you know I, mean, I don't like the anonymous stuff. The best thing about the anonymous thing, everyone knows it's not me. I, put, I would put my name on it. I mean, you know, so I was, of course it's not me. Okay, but what is this person doing, he or she? Put your name on it. Own it. It's an act, you know, you're saying it, so let's put your name on it. So my point is, we're here now. I would have thought the Republicans would have said, no mas. This is crazy. They've decided that they're going to put up with it for now. But there's public hearings coming, and there'll be an acceleration of what's going on. And by the way, there's a couple more things that are going to drop here. And when those things drop, I think that they will be overwhelming to the situation, and he'll be forced out of office. Now, if I'm wrong about that, I said in the back here, they put up Elizabeth Warren. He somehow survives this, and let's face it, he sort of survives everything. So you have to sort of think that if you're a money manager, you have to put probability on him surviving. And they put up Elizabeth Warren, he'll, he'll beat her. He'll beat Elizabeth Warren. But you're saying he would be removed from office before that? I do predict that, yes. I still maintain that he will not get removed by the Senate. He'll leave the way Richard Nixon left. Or he'll say that he's not running for re-election the way Lyndon Johnson. I still believe that because of what I know. And I, and I believe that the system, after 243 years, a civil war, two world wars, the Teapot Dome scandal and Watergate, the system has miraculously survived and I believe the system is stronger than Donald Trump. What, what would need to, to, to happen for Elizabeth to, to win, let's say, and she's a front runner now? Uh, well, I mean, I think that she would right definitely, I think number one, she'd have to tack to the middle. I know her a very, very long time. She wasn't one of my professors at Harvard Law School, but she got to the school in 93. I graduated in 89. Uh, she's very much so a political moderate. Um, she did exactly what Ted Cruz did, but in an opposite direction. So Ted Cruz, if you know him, graduated from law school in 94, political moderate. He decided he was going to be a Tea Party conservative to make a name for himself and to rise in stature in a typically traditional lockstep party. Elizabeth Warren decided she was going to tack far to the left, sort of the doppelganger reflection of the Tea Party on the left in order to create that similar rise. She's effective, she's very talented, she's very smart. She would have to get into the middle. Uh, I don't think the wealth tax could get put through because of the checks and balances in the country, but she would probably have to drop that. I think, that would, I think it's gonna hurt her a lot, frankly, because it's anti-American. You can't tell somebody, here's the deal, we're gonna, we're gonna tax, New York State, you're at 54% if you're a resident of, of New York City. So now you're a minority partner in your own life. I mean, Bill de Blasio is your general partner. I just want you to think about that, right? So the dollar's coming in. You're giving 54 cents to Bill and Donald and uh, Andrew. You're keeping 46 or 47 cents. And now you're deciding not to consume it, but you're going to save it. And you invest it wisely, and that 47 cents grows into $50 million. And you didn't consume it, and now you want to give it to your children. But Elizabeth Warren's going to come in and take it from you. I think it's very anti-American. I don't think people... Uh, are gonna like that. It's just, remember, money, you can say whatever you want about socialism, you can believe in it, it doesn't work. Money flows to where incentives are. That is an axiomatic fact about money. And so she's disrupting and corrupting the incentives with her policies, a result of which she would have to change that, I think. Well, what, what do you millennials think are driving? moving more towards the left in this country and everywhere in the world. Uh, yeah, but I don't really believe that. Let me tell you why, because number one, the, they don't really vote. But when they start voting and they start getting a paycheck, like I have a 27-year-old son, he's, uh, he was working this summer, he's going to Stanford Business School, and he looked at the tax effect on his earnings, and he was like, whoa, this is crazy. So what ends up happening is you're sort of very left-leaning in your 20s, but by the time you get to your 40s, and you can prove this demographically, you become more moderate, more uh, sensible. Uh, and less uh, academic about the situation. But, but what do you think is, is driving that sentiment on the left, though? I mean, if you, you know, whatever you think of Elizabeth Warren's policy, she has gained traction within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. This anger of this inequality that at least her supporters view in the U.S., is that a similar symptom to what we saw with President Trump back in 2016? Yeah, it's, it's the exact same thing. And so I, I used to tell people this, that I went to 
26 or 27 Trump rallies, four Bernie Sanders rallies. And you would have been blown away at the similarity of those rallies. And again, what is it? I'll, I'll put it in personal terms. My dad's 1976 wages, he was in the operating engineer union on Long Island. He was a heavy crane operator. His 1976 wages I priced in 2016. Same union, same local, blah, blah. Down 26.5% in real economic terms. So here's a guy who had a skill. He could operate a crane. He did it for 42 years. He's 84 today. He's more or less deaf because he didn't use the right protection. In outdoors, hot and cold weather, operated the crane, got a high hourly wage, created a good blue-collar, middle-class lifestyle for himself, his three children, and his wife. That very same guy, down 26% in real economic terms, you need an EBT card to survive on Long Island. So those people transition, like I said, aspirational, Anthony, I'm going to hit you with a belt if you don't do your homework. Okay, so I did my homework to, okay, my son is not going to do better than me. Now what? I'm very pissed off. I'm very angry at what's going on in the society. Elizabeth Warren is offering me a solution from the left, and I'm a left-leaning person. That's great. Donald Trump is offering me a solution from the right. Now, did Donald Trump actually offer a solution? He did not. Empirically, none of those policies that he's implemented in the last three years has helped those people. However... However, he is an avatar for their anger. He has got his thumb in the eye of the mainstream media. He's got his thumb in the eye of the perceived elites. And they like that because they feel left out. And when you feel left out, and remember, from a blue collar neighborhood, I get it, okay? I mean, I, I, I went from there to where I am today, but I get it. When you feel left out, you are susceptible to conspiracies. You're susceptible that it's, us versus them. You're susceptible that there's something mean out there that's encroaching upon your family. Uh, and the president plays to that. He goes right after that to galvanize those people. And in a weird way, Senator Warren does that on the left. And, and so does Senator Sanders. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I wonder if we can tap into one more conversation in the context It's of almost lasted as long as my White House job, <laughs> today, because that's pretty good. In the context of the election, the conversations that are happening, you talked about the anger that's happening uh, on the left. What we've also heard is from a lot of executives, sort of the, the Ray Dalios of the world, the Jamie Dimons of the world, who have come forward and said, look, we have to listen to that. Capitalism needs to be tweaked. It's not working as is. I'm wondering what you think all of this conversation, this reflection that we're at least hear, hearing publicly, uh, is going to lead to? Is this just so, a conversation you know, that's going to happen? I, you know, I, I watched Jamie's interview last night. I talked to Jamie last night after his interview. I know Ray pretty well. I respect where they're coming from, but what I would say is that um, if you've gone through a process, you're worth 17 or $1 billion, and you're reflecting back on the process and you want to change the rules of the road now, I got a question mark about that. Um, what I would say is I would go back through our history, and I don't have a slide, but if you look at the economic rent distribution between labor and capital, I can prove to you that when it's economically distributed 50-50, country's very, very, very happy. Social contract is working. It right now is at 59.41, and so more of it is going to capital. And when that happens, 1890 to 1910, during the 1930s and the rise of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the rise of Teddy Roosevelt, his uh, uncle or cousin, um, you have to close that gap and you have to come up with the right tax and social policies to close that gap to sustain the free market capitalist system. And so what you don't wanna do is you, you have to look at the system honestly and say it's lifted more people out of poverty than any system in civilization. It is a absolutely flawed model, but you don't wanna throw the the flawed model into the garbage place, what you want to do is create more incentives, more safety nets, uh, an earned income tax credit as an example, or negative income tax effectively for the, the bottom tier of the people. And you can get there without corrupting and throwing the whole system out. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you go to socialism, there are people in this room that have lived in socialist countries, and they know it doesn't work because Socialist countries, the tippy top get very rich. They hover around the government. It's sort of this radical klepto capitalism. 
and the poor get annihilated because there's no incentives. Uh, and, and last time I was in Cuba, I was touring Cuba, free health care, 65% of the hospitals in Cuba have no running water. They literally have to take the patients out of the hospitals to latrines and outhouses outside the hospitals. It's just bad incentives. You can't, you can't do that to the country. So, so we're here again, 5941. It's got to go back to 5050. And here's the irony of what I'm saying. 3% of the population owns the capital. So the irony is you can give 3% of the population 50% of the profits and 97% of the population the other 50% and you've got a pretty happy place and you've got sustainable innovation and growth. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we all know this in this room, we've got nothing going on in terms of policy, job training, infrastructure, education. There's no 10, 15, 20 year plan for America. Every single one of these problems could be resolved with the right policies, the right social tax, fiscal policies. But we're not doing that. We're beating each other up on cable news. We're name calling, nicknaming, torching each other. And we're all tribal. Some of us are going to go home tonight and watch Fox. Others are going to watch MSNBC. If you really hate Trump, you'll watch CNN. I mean, they really hate Trump on that, right? And so you'll, you'll, you'll pick your channel and you'll stay in your confirmed biases of your tribe when the country's rotten. And we got to fix it. And so, you know, for me, I'm a business person. I hate these people in politics. But I'm looking at it now. I accidentally got myself in it. And I love my country, and I've lived a good part of the American dream, so I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it very honestly. There was, a, there was a woman in the back. I don't know who it was. We've met before. She said, well, thank you, because it sounds honest. It sounds truthful. Yeah, of course. The guy has broken the law. You want to let him get away with it, go ahead. You like your 401k, let him get away with it. But then you're going to tip a domino into the system that could potentially disrupt the system that has been the most prosperous and successful system for the most diverse group of people in the world. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm just telling you. It's, it's a, this system, you, you're Indian American, Italian American, Croatian American, whatever you are in this, you're American because of this system. We gotta keep the system and just fix it. You can't throw the system out or let one person be above the system. Come on, guys, we're smarter than that. Okay. Thank you very much, Anthony. Are we done? Anna, Kiko. Yes. Thank so we're you. not taking any questions? All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. Did you did you enjoy the therapy in the beginning with the divorce? I mean it was horrifying, right? <laughs> Try to stay married, okay? That's my last message for today.